I'm really happy to hear there's so much discussions going on and a lot of networking because that's one of the reasons we have the stakeholder forum. It's actually for you to create the forum where you all can meet and discuss. So we're really happy to, to see that. Uh, but it's time to kick off the afternoon session. Uh, before I will introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, um, I've heard that there are a lot of questions going on, but the new executive director from Canada, why don't you take a European? Actually, he is European. He's very much European. He's Irish French. And he has studied in the UK and he has done his PhD in France and he has worked in Ireland and he's only temporary in Canada and he's now coming back to Europe. So you don't need to be worried. There is a European who has been nominated <laughs> for those of you who were worried. Uh, so now back to the program. Uh, so we will start the afternoon session um, with Philippe de Bakker, who is a member of the European Parliament, and he sits on the ITRE committee, which is the committee in the Parliament for Industry, Research and Energy. Um, Philippe is an excellent speaker for this occasion, not only because he's an excellent speaker, but also because he has a very good knowledge of this field, because he has a PhD in bio technology. He has worked as a technology transfer officer um, in the area of uh, biotechnology and he has also worked for a venture capital company. So he has a very broad experience um, in this field. And uh, Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I actually feel more at home uh, here before this audience than I do in the European Parliament with lawyers, sociologists, economists. It's always good that we can uh, speak uh, among scientists and see how we can bring science forward. Um, I think that usually politicians start by sketching out uh, quite a negative image, image of the sector or the problem that they are trying to tackle. Well, I'm by heart an optimist. And I truly believe that there has never been an age, a time, that has been better to live in than today. Because even compared with 50 years ago, the average human now earns nearly three times as much money, eats one-third more calories, although we can ask ourselves if this is a good thing, buries two-thirds fewer children, and can expect to live one-third longer. And in fact, it's hard to find any region of the world that is worse off now than it was then, even though the global population has more than doubled over that period. So it is clear that good health concerns us all, but it's also key to our happiness and vital to an active and creative society, and in the end also a vibrant economy. So I believe that aging populations are one of the major achievements of the 20th century, and that's why it was declared that only growing natural research is the 21st century. And so I think that we need to take into consideration this change of mindset. A mindset that is hopefully also changing at the European level, and in the end, hopefully, also member states will understand how to cope with some of the new challenges. In times of budgetary constraints, member states take a look at their healthcare system and they see costs. They see disadvantages. They see expensive treatments that put a cost on their social security system and their public health budgets. But the question is, how can we change that? How can we make sure that we take a step forward and make healthcare affordable again? With over 20 billion euros spent annually in the European Union on pharmaceutical innovation and health-related R&D, it is vital for the European economy that we remain major players in the strategic and high-value-added sector. And when it comes to access to healthcare, it's very simple. Every patient should get the most effective treatment in a continent like Europe, where wealth is there, is compared, is, we are much wealthier than many other regions, so there's no reason whatsoever why we shouldn't take a good look at the systems that we have and to make sure that in the end we change them to deliver the standard of care that every patient uh, deserves. We know that we are seeing a shift nowadays towards more personalized medicines, and the reason is simple. These kinds of drugs have the potential to offer more effective and safer treatments for individual patients. But the more we personalize our drugs, the more we are heading to a situation where all diseases can be considered rare diseases that need maybe a tailor-made, personalized therapy. And it goes without saying that a shift towards more, more personalized medicines also goes hand-in-hand hand with a bigger focus on research and development. 
At European level, we try to support research and development and innovation through the Horizon 2020 program. Also now, I heard from the Commission uh, through the Juncker Investment Fund, which has as a key priority also health and research innovation. And specifically here today, also IMI, which I think has over the last couple of years developed really a track record in how we can move things forward. And so IMI, I think, is a very good example of how both the expertise from the public and the private sector can join hands and don't contradict each other, but they join hands to solve problems that are maybe too difficult or too risky to tackle for individual companies or societies as a whole even. And so we know that since 2008, IMI has funded 23 projects with a total budget of more than 400 million euros and involving an impressive range of different partners, different research teams, academic institutions, SMEs, and not to forget patient organizations, which I think at that moment was one of the first times patients were really recognized as true stakeholders in the process. And also the regulatory agencies started cooperating around IMI. And so we issued an additional 2 billion euros for the coming five years to bring IMI forward and to hopefully also bring new therapies, new insights, new developments closer to the market and closer to the patients. We all know that in the beginning maybe IMI suffered some children diseases as have we all, but I do believe that it's a very interesting concept and that this way of cooperation can lead to improvements in research and also finally in new treatments and developments for patients. But we are still identifying and discussing the strengths, weaknesses and gaps in current measures to support the innovation chain. We know that most people see innovation as kind of a linear process, going forward from the lab, to a company, to a patient. But the people in this room, I think, understand more than anywhere, anyone else that this is no longer true, that we are really looking at the true ecosystem of stakeholders and players who are trying to bring innovation forward. So the question will be, if we want to remain competitive, if we really want to deliver a fundamental change in our healthcare system and how we deal with the del delivery of care, we will also have to keep innovating. And today, I don't see enough of that at member state level. Often we see vested interest, often we see a very big reluctance to do things differently, to take a different approach. Often we also see political games being played at the back of patient organizations or patients themselves even. And so I also think that innovation here can be key and I think we as policy makers should really try to drive the science-based policy making but also push for the fact that in the end the innovation is what's going to save our European economy. We have to be quicker, better, faster, more clever than any of the other regions around the globe. But at the same time, we will also have to extend our cooperation. We will not have to only defend what we have today, but really start looking forward on how we can also collaborate internationally. And I think IMI here is also again leading the way. But in the end, when all the research is done, when all the development has been uh, behind, and when all the products have come to the market, there are still issues around reimbursement. The high cost of newly developed drugs, uh, or the perceived high cost of newly developed drugs, is putting strains on our social security system and our public health budget. But people are also creative enough to find solutions here, to be innovative, to look at, for example, new payment methods, to look at new ways on how even expensive treatments can be delivered uh, to patients. And I will give you a very concrete idea of one example that I've raised during the uh, rare disease uh, day a couple of weeks ago. We know that, for example, in rare diseases, uh, life-threatening diseases that affect less than 50 out of 100, uh, 50, less than 50 out of 100,000 people, orphan diseases, we know that only a relative few people are affected by this. But if you consider all the European citizens who suffer from one of the estimated 8,000 existing orphan diseases, the European Commission counts between 27 and 36 million European citizens. Yet, only 160 orphan drugs have been registered so far. Put differently, more than 98% of rare diseases, no adequate cure has been developed yet. So, there's a huge poten potential here to increase the well-being and the health of uh, a lot of different people across the European Union. And we have taken initiatives at the European level to encourage the development of orphan treatments through special recognition programs, the, yeah, the IMI also, but IMI also increased the visibility and support to national research programs. But we also lack a common European approach endorsed by all member states. And that is why, for example, in the treatment of orphan diseases, I raised the idea to establish a European fund for rare diseases. It should be done at the European level, no longer at member state level. And I think it would 
offer a lot of different uh, concrete advantages. I think it would help pharma companies to develop their drugs and to bring them to the market faster. Why? Because they know that they will have a single entry point and a single price point also in the end when they go through the whole process. And at a European level, we are much better capable because the market is larger to develop new innovative pricing strategies which will also endorse pharma's uh, search for uh, reinvestment of their uh, profits into research and development. At the same time, of course, it would also strengthen the negotiation position on price for different member states. For pharma companies, it would help them to go through a single HAH process instead of going through every single member state and negotiate 28 different times on a price point and to uh, the regulatory uh, setting behind. And it can also be, I think, in the end, the guarantee for all patients that wherever they are in Europe, they will get the adequate standard of care. And so I think these concrete advantages together would make this European Fund a no-brainer. Also politically, because I know that in many different member states, many governments are being beaten up by many organizations to say, look, there is something available, there is a new drug, why are you not reimbursing, or why do you take so much time to reimburse? And so in that aspect, I think it would also be politically a step forward. And so the question now becomes, how can we make it happen? How can we really start implementing this? And also there, I think, you see that collaboration like IMI clearly shows that a, a partnership between the public and the private sector is possible, and it's a win-win for both of them. So I think co concrete examples which show that IMI can work will also lead to new in initiatives being developed, and I hope that in time we can also convince the member states to let go a little bit of their vested interest and so-called, in my opinion, misunderstood sovereignty, and I think that also there at European level we can do uh, much more. But in the end, of course, it's up to us as policymakers to, to, to move things forward, to give you the frameworks in which you can function, and to make sure that you are also in a stable environment where you can do what you do best. You do your research, you do your development, you come up with new creative ideas, and in the end, you make them happen to make sure that every patient across the European Union does get the treatment and get, does get the standard of care that he or she deserves. I hope that in the next couple of years, we will continue the good cooperation, that we can move things forward, because in the end, um, you've listened now for 10 or 15 minutes to a politician talking, but in the end, it's about what we do on the ground, what is happening in the world outside of this hotel, and in the end, it's about implementation, and I'm hoping that I can be your partner on that for the next couple of years. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Philippe, for those thought-provoking words, and uh, which also shows that it's not only about the early stages of research. Research needs to be done throughout the whole innovation chain uh, to make sure that new innovative ideas reaches patients very fast. We will now hear from the two founding members of IMI, from the European Union, uh, and on behalf of the Commission, and also from the FBS side. We will start with the Commission, so I would like to introduce Julia Delbrenna, who is Deputy Head of Cabinet for Cabinet Moedas uh, for Research and Innovation, and later on we will hear from Magda Klebus on behalf of FBA, and they will tell you a little bit about their vision and their views where they would like to see IMI going in the coming years. Julia. Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing and for having invited me. A couple of years ago, I used to, to work with uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry or, or inside the Commission, so I am glad to be here also because I saw a number of familiar faces and that's always good. And I'm glad to be here also uh, talking again about this very same topic, which is dear to me, but is also particularly important to, to all of us, not only as professionals, but also as citizens. So I am I too, I was asked to give my point of view, well, the point of view from the side of the politicians inside the Commission uh, after the Parliament, where are we now and where next? 
Well, where are we now? I think uh, it looks like a good place. So Drava, I'd say, a place full of, of potential. And I will try to outline very fast in a short presentation how I am my two links to the political priorities of the Commission in general and of my Commission in particular. To whom should I? I just, <laughs> okay. Ah, here we are. Great. So President Juncker, when uh, um, he arrived, so he, he chose the portfolio for the, the, the commissioners and sent them a mission letter. And I put in this slide uh, these items of the things he was asking Commission Wenders to do and that I think relate in particular to what IMI uh, does and is supposed to do. First of all, he was asking Commissioner Moedas to promote international excellence of EU's research and science and strengthen research capacities. And I think IMI has got really a huge contribution to give in that field, contribution that has been already in the first phase of the program shown, and now there is a lot of potential to continue doing so. Uh, the second bullet is more about what you should be doing inside the Commission, but I put it there because this issue of the, 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 the coordination about actors is, but is very important in IMI too and is really something extremely important. Nowadays, science is not only about the science, the lab, but it's about working together and it's about contributing to, 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 to challenges outside. And the only way to do it is to do it together and to give really large space to scientific evidence. With then this link to society, which is very important in the political guidelines of President Juncker, uh, this objective of growth and jobs. The last bullet I put on the slide is about exactly what is done in IMI, is to, to focus on uh, the end of the uh, science to, to market um, line. Uh, it's about working together with the private sector uh, with a special focus on SMEs uh, and the, with the idea of strengthening the industrial leadership in Europe. So how does Commissioner Moedas translate this mission letter into his uh, priorities? So when he gives out public speeches, he always focuses on three uh, priorities. The first one about creating the necessary, necessary conditions for growth and a good environment for research uh, and, and innovation, which sounds a bit strange because he begins talking about things that are not uh, science. But why? Because in Europe there is great science. And he uses to say, he says often, we are very good uh, at transforming euros into knowledge, but not so good at transforming knowledge into euros. And one of the ways to solve the situation is to create conditions, to work in a different way. And I think IMI is a very good example of that. The second uh, priority for him is to increase the overall investment in research and innovation. So he's a, he has inherited of a program of nearly 8 billion euros over seven years. Uh, in a pe period of austerity, the, the, the Parliament and the Council have decided to increase in quite uh, an impressive way this budget. So this is a bit, not exactly what has been happening in member states. Um, there is a huge increase from FP7 to Horizon 2020. But what he intends to do during his mandate is to have to accompany that with an increase in public investment outside of uh, Horizon and private investment. Again, IMI has shown that this can be done and there is also a huge increase from my IMI 1 to IMI 2. The third uh, of his priorities is bringing together science and diplomacy with the idea of assessing uh, global threats. Uh, I know you heard this morning and you all know about uh, how IMI was mobilized for Ebola and how fast, given commission times, uh, we managed to put uh, 200 million euros in research for vaccines and treatment for Ebola. Uh, these kind of instruments that are flexible, that have the knowledge necessary, that have the will to address uh, threats out, out there are uh, important instruments for my commission. <coughs> So now we have this wonderful slide, but you will see again, because um, 
we tried, uh, so this, this doesn't come from me, this comes from uh, the Director General for Research and Innovation, and it is how Horizon 2020 is organized, which is a bit of a puzzle, but you see there in red IMI2, and it's important, it's important for us, and, and you will see in the next uh, presentation, because it shows that IMI is not a strange thing out there. IMI is fully integrated in Horizon 2020, and IMI is a part of the structure that aims at addressing health challenges. IMI, so it's the same, but it's different. And what's important about IMI, apart from its peculiarities, and we went, uh, I, I addressed briefly about uh, cooperation, collaboration, new ways of working, but IMI is really complementary with other things we do in Horizon 2020, and not only in societal challenges health. To a bit illustrate that very fast, and I close in one minute, I'll see how, well, give some examples of these works for biomarkers, for example. Biomarkers is something that is addressed in IMI, everybody knows that, but it's also addressed in the other parts of the, of the program. It is, for example, if you see, in, addressed in Excellent Science, a number of uh, grants have been given uh, to scientists that work with biomarkers. I put this example that I searched with Google. So if you do biomarker European Research Council grant, you get 3,000 entries. So I tried desperately to find one with a woman scientist, and there we get to a problem. We have uh, a couple of them uh, dealing with biomarkers for dietary purposes, so I nearly put this one. But I then chose this one, even if it's, it is a gentleman, because it is about proof of concept. So these are the small grants uh, the ESC gives to scientists when they discover something in order to do this little bridge towards the market. So I put this example, it's no judgment, you can find plenty of them if you go there. And then uh, this SME instrument, if we go back again, so that's the second circle on industrial leadership. In the field of health, it was decided to focus on biomarkers, so a number of uh, SMEs could come with projects and get the support that goes also on the support on, on really the feasibility, not only the science, because as, again, I say, knowledge, we have plenty, says my commission, but how to transform it into euros, and there is a, a lot of support for that in the field of um, biomarkers, and there is there an example that, again, that was chosen by my colleagues of what it is done there. And there is no ending to my presentation because the idea now is to hand immediately over to, to Magda that will tell you uh, how this translates uh, in IMI from the point of view of the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually I would take this story from the place where Julia stopped it and uh, show you What's next? And what's next is actually, hopefully that would work, or not. Aha. Thank you. Good. So can I have the next slide then, since this doesn't seem to work? So I'll take it from the, from the place where Julia ended, if, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so it is great to hear, great, wonderful. So, so it is true that uh, Julia said we have these biomarkers developed in one or the other um, initiative, and we would do a little bit of work on that. But what is really important is would we stay in these individual very nice biomarkers who can be very sexy, very nice, beautiful in itself, a huge scientific value, or would we do something with them and make sure that we are actually going to translate them into something else? Would we embed them into the ecosystem, into the research ecosystem, into the, the practice, so that they can be really useful and that we could um, actually do something useful with them for the patients? So from science through publication 
to the real practice. And I think that this is where IMI actually is helping us a lot. And why? It is because IMI has these features that Julia has already talked about, and I'll try to actually lead you through them as well again, and then to give some more examples of how it works in practice. So we have these little cogwheels, and we want to embed them into the research processes and to make sure that they actually can be um, used in real life research practice, medical practice, and, uh, and regulatory practice. This means that we need to bring together many people. It's not just about a collaboration between one company with a few academic centers, uh, with maybe one or two regulators. It is about recreating, in a way, the same ecosystem which would be using these tools in real life. And this is what we are trying to do in IMI, to recreate these mini ecosystems which will test things in real life and change if it, they can be upscaled, not just in one company, but in many companies. Uh, we would so show that they can be part of the research processes, that they can be um, uh, useful, feasible, and useful for the regulators and for the doctors. And also, by bringing all people together, we would look at all facets of the same problem and make sure that we can look at all um, <clears throat> or uh, challenges at the same time. So, IMI, this ecosystem, what is it? It is a place where we are going to deep dive into one particular subject in a series of particular subjects. I'll show them on the next slide. Where we are going to look across the entire healthcare spectrum uh, from prevention, treatment, and health management. I'll show you one concrete example in a second. We are going to look at the entire value chain of research and development because these biomarkers or other tools would actually play a role at every stage. Uh, same would hold true for big data that we are going to discuss later this afternoon. So we look from early discovery through development up to healthcare delivery and access models because we are creating not just new collaborations but also new business models for future products or for the products of the future. We are also bringing together different sectors. It's quite easy to say but actually you are doing that already. Yes, it is true that pharmaceutical companies and diagnostic companies and imaging companies work together. That's true. We didn't need necessarily IMI for doing that. But the scale of this collaboration in IMI and the fact that we are recreating this ecosystem where we are going to check if things work in real life, not in um, research conditions, but in real life, in our research practice, this is quite new and this is something that were, which is enabled by IMI because of the structure it offers us. Um, and also collaboration across stakeholders groups. I mean, for the first time, we really have a place where the regulated and the regulators and the decision makers and the patients, the users, actually get together. So again, we have a, another real-life safe harbor ecosystem in which we can test the most crazy ideas. And these most crazy ideas, what they are, well, it's the future. We don't know yet, but I'll show you again a few examples. I know that I'm holding your breath uh, for these examples, but I'll, it's coming in a second. I'll show you a few examples of how it works in, in reality. Uh, so what's different between Horizon 2020 and IMI, or rather how IMI is really complementary to all instruments uh, of Horizon 2020, because, because we are bringing all those industrial stakeholders together and help to test these new ideas in real life conditions. Where are we now? where we actually moved quite a long way. And this is the slide from my last year presentation. Some of you might remember that. We've said we are going to actually focus, and this is the statement, on the deep dive in a, in a few themes where we can really make a difference. So this is the slide from last year. We've decided at that time that in order to make the difference, we are going to focus in order not to spread ourselves thin. But if you look at the right-hand side of this slide, we are going to approach all of these topics through all the facets. We are going to analyze all the problems and make sure that we actually really make a difference and have a critical mass of research in these fields in order to design concrete solutions for the future. Are we there? I hope we are actually are on the right path. I cannot say that we are there because it's just one year, not even that of IMI2. But, but I, I think that I hope that next slide would show you that at least we are really attempting to do so. So programs, 
I think this is the solution to some of our problems of the risk of spreading ourselves thin and not making a difference. And what I heard today from the keynote speaker from GDRF um, about diabetes type 1, I think it's really an, uh, indeed a great example of where we need to work not just within the silos but also across the different silos. So diabetes is one of the key uh, uh, of the key uh, priorities. You saw that in the previous slide, um, metabolic diseases as well as immune, uh, <coughs> uh, immune mediated diseases. Of course, diabetes is part of the two. So we have already to work across the different silos. We have to work not just across the different silos of um, therapeutic careers or medical uh, disciplines, but we have also to work across the silos of different um, industries. Uh, because here we really have to engage with the diagnostic industry and with IT industry and medtech industry and otherwise just we would, not be, um, we would not be successful. So you see that we have a diabetes program which has already delivered a few uh, projects which have been launched in call one and in call three I think of IMI two. Um, we have the next calls which are oh what a surprise again biomarker idea. So these biomarkers seem to play a very important role here. Uh, so we are going to have yet another project, but when you look at the, the other side, you would see that in neurodegeneration, rather degeneration, because the program is really about degeneration, not that much about neurodegeneration alone, we are looking at, again, macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. We are looking across the borders. We are actually breaking these silos, and it was important to show that we are actually saying what we, we are doing, what we, what we said would be doing, to, to bring forces together, to work across silos, to work again, uh, across disciplines, and to, to create a new value, which otherwise wouldn't be possible, and which actually is enabled by IMI, but the knowledge comes from upstream as well. This programmatic approach is probably even better visible in the programs that we already have in place. So let's have a look at this one, New Drugs for Bad Bugs. It has been mentioned already several times today. Uh, we are indeed um, investing a lot in antimicrobial resistance. It is a big problem for, uh, for the society at large, for the patients, for the medical profession, for uh, healthcare systems, for healthcare budget. But um, maybe it's not so um, clear on this slide, but we actually are addressing new drugs for bad box antimicrobial resistance through programs that look at development of products, at discovery and filling in the pipelines with new uh, molecules because we don't have enough of this uh, idea. We are looking at access, at business models that would balance uh, price and, and uh, um, um, business viability. This is extremely important. And we are also looking at development networks to make sure that we have the right infrastructure in order to run uh, the, the, the project, the clinical trials in the future. Uh, and also that we uh, look at, uh, again, new solutions, new therapeutic solutions and not just antibiotic itself. Um, Ebola, we've discussed that again today. Uh, Ebola is a place where we have a program that looks across sectors. We have set a program on rapid diagnostics, on vaccines, manufacturing infrastructure, stability during transport, um, and in the future, probably also other therapies. So again, we have a program where we break the silos across different disciplines, create a coherent and consistent program that would address one particular challenge but in depth and bringing together all players, different industries, different stakeholders and different companies within the same sector. Uh, let's have a look at another one. This is the new kit on the block. It's not yet launched, but it would be subject of the third session today. Um, it is about the big data and leveraging the potential of real world evidence. How can we use real world evidence for the benefit of research, for the benefit of healthcare systems, for the benefit of safety? And again, this program would show us how we can combine all sectors, all stakeholders, all objectives together and make sure that we can deliver a real value at the end of this, uh, of this research. So 
This is what we've done until now, and I suggest that you also look at the IMI website to see which projects are planned. I just showed a few examples, but on the IMI webpage on future calls, you see already a number of topics that are planned for call five, and I really encourage you to have a look at that. This is our pre-marketing exercise. You can start building your consortia around that, uh, so please have a look. But where do we go next? Where these, um, this uh, ecosystem that IMI enables can help us to maybe, again, de deliver new solutions and new quality. Um, I've already mentioned better health through big data. Up upscaling advanced therapies, I think many people today mentioned advanced therapies and the challenges it brings. That's another possible big theme for our discussion and you would have um, a session today uh, as well as on big data in order to actually test to provide your feedback on how relevant these topics are, um, how important and whether we are actually asking the right questions. Oh, surprise, again biomarkers, biomarker strat strategy. The issue here is that we have, I don't know how many thousands of biomarkers published per year, but as I said, they are never getting to the patient. So um, maybe there is a time now for actually putting a strategy in place which would make sure that we get from science and publication to the patient, to the diagnostic, to the stratification tool, to whatever it is. And finally, we've just started a discussion on One Health, um, this connection between animal and human health and how we can again bridge between uh, uh, two sectors that are part of the same industry but would certainly benefit from working together. So in summary, and coming back to the little puzzle that, uh, that Julia shown in her slide, in her slide deck, uh, IMI is the place where we can complement, create a quite a specific ecosystem, but not as a, um, something different, but as something complementary that adds value and that helps creating these safe harbors in which we can test new ideas so that we can create new value for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia and Magda, for that outlook. Uh, we will now have a panel discussion and to discuss a little bit more about where are we now. There will be some very experienced participants um, in IMI from various aspects will be, that will be part of this session and they will soon come up to the stage. Um, I'm also happy to let you know that both Philippe, Magda and Julia will also stay. So during the dis panel discussion, you can also pose questions to, to them as well as the panelists. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, the moderator for this session. And the moderator is Adam Smith, and he is the Chief Scientific Officer for Nobel Media. Adam? Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, panelists, please join me on stage. Thank you. Sanjoy will hit here. Let's. Donata here. Corinne here. Please. Donata? Sanjoy. Like a good dinner party, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. So yes, I'm Adam Smith. It's my pleasure and honor to be here to moderate this panel discussion. And as Rudolf Stromer said at the beginning of the day, today is about taking stock and um, thinking about the potential for the future. And this panel discussion is very much in that vein, um, giving people the chance to describe where we are and how things are developing and might develop uh, in the years to come. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to be joined by a wonderful group of panellists who represent uh, various different stakeholders at this meeting. First we have Donata Medallini who is an Associate Professor of Microbiology at the University of Siena. Then we have Sanjay Dutta, Dutta I'm sorry, who comes from the diabetes charity JDRF and you are, I'm going to have to read this, your uh, uh, Assistant Vice President for Translational Development and Innovation Partnerships. And we have Corinne de Vries, who comes from the European Medicines Agency and is Head of Science and Innovation Support. Now, during the discussion, I will be reaching out to the audience, both live and online, for questions and comments. Um, but I'd like to start by having the panelists introduce themselves a little bit by talking about how they currently interact with IMI2. So, Corinne, why don't you begin? What do you currently do? Thank you. 
Uh, can I start by saying thank you to the organizers for inviting uh, a representative from the agency to be here. It's great, it's great to be here. As an agency, we've been involved with IMI from the beginning. Uh, I think the first IMI Project Protects was led by um, the European Medicines Agency. But our involvement has evolved, and um, our involvement is on various levels. So we uh, respond to the public consultation when the strategic research agenda is, uh, is out for public consultation. We also suggest topics regularly for IMI research projects. We uh, occasionally provide input into draft call text, and we are working to developing that further. We sit on some consortia, but not all of them. And sometimes we sit on external advisory boards for projects. I think that summarizes it for now. Mm -hmm. Multiple levels of interaction. Earlier in the day, it was mentioned that it's for the regulatory authorities, there's a particular challenge in being involved, but not too close. I guess we'll come to a discussion of that later. But in general, is that a problem, a problem for EMA? <coughs> We, we try to be very careful, and so far, touch wood, I don't think we've been criticized um, for it. I think with IMI, the, the nice thing is that it's not product-specific, it's disease-specific methods are being developed. Um, and in that sense, I think if we can find ways in which we, we can collaborate without being perceived to have a conflict of interest. Um, we, we try to focus on, okay, is it in European public health? Is it crucial that the regulator is at the table in this particular research project? Would it fill without our involvement? Can we help um, through continuous dialogue uh, and point the, the investigators to opportunities for dialogue with the regulators at an early stage, etc.? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sanjoy. Sure. I want to echo Corinne's thanks for inviting JDRF, and I'm proud to be representing JDRF, and I want to just give a shout out for my colleague Olivier, who has been instrumental in, uh, arc in, in, the, in, in orchestrating the partnership with IMI here. Um, JDRF has been involved with IMI for a number of years, but in a more peripheral space initially. Uh, we came in to support programs such as the IMIDIA and Summit projects. But when the IMI2 call was launched, we have become a more active participant here. So we're now an associate partner and on specific calls also the co-coordinator. So like perhaps to some extent the EMA, we are involved in the design and architecture of specific calls, what the remit would be, and, and then play also a role in future calls that can benefit the patients ultimately. So we're more an active partner at this point in time. Mm. It must have been quite a major step to become, to, to take on such an active role in IMI. What led you to make that decision? Sure, um, at multiple levels again. Uh, I would answer your question with a question, why not? <laughs> so it just, uh, the founding principles of JDRF seem to be almost mirrored by the principal objectives of the IMI. It is patient-centric, uh, trying to integrate cross-disciplines uh, bringing together uh, cross disciplines in terms of specialty, also uh, cross disciplines in terms of trying to bring together basic research, clinical research, uh, development of therapies, regulatory uh, perspective in it. So it went the whole gamut, which is exactly what JDRF does here. So it was a very obvious step to be taking, and, uh, and it was almost um, imperative for us to do it. The challenge comes in allocating resources to it because uh, this is, we are not obviously being funded by the IMI. We are putting in resources into here, financial, non-financial, and other resources. So it's always a struggle of balancing uh, the various needs here. But it appeared to be a win-win situation, so it was not a difficult decision to make. Mm, thank you. On the resource balancing question, <laughs> Corinne, I guess you might have something to say also, because you're in the same, EMA is in the same position. I was making a note to myself for later. Thank you. Um, yes. So what we have found is that as, as IMI has evolved, people contact us more and more because they see that the regulator has uh, potentially a role to play in the, in the research project that is being uh, proposed. And um, under the current financial re regulation, we are not allowed to receive research funding. And so we've got to be quite careful as to what we commit to as an agency 
because once we commit to it, we then have to deliver and we have to put the, you know, we have to put our money where our mouth is, as it were. We have to put the effort in. And that takes us away from the core business. Um, so it's, it's a challenge. And we try to, so we try to find ways in how to do it better um, to make sure that, okay, we have, and we're developing this, that we have criteria. So when is it absolutely crucial that we are part of a consortium? When is being a member of an advisory board sufficient so that there is a dialogue with the regulator, but the, the, the crux of the work is carried out by, by the consortium? Mm. Um, yeah, I'm happy to more on it later. If yes, indeed, we'll come back to it. Thank you. Donata. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would like first also to thank the organizer for giving the opportunity of sharing with you uh, my experience in the participation of, uh, in IMI projects. Uh, I interact with IMI both as a scientist, a scientist doing research in the context of IMI project in the laboratories of the University of Siena where I'm working, uh, but also as a coordinator, um, as coordinator of IMI projects on behalf of the Sclavo Vaccine Association, which is a non-for-profit organization devoted to vaccine research and development involving 11 institutions from all around Europe. Um, I am the uh, coordinator of uh, the VSB Ebovac project, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the study of safety and immunogenicity of uh, the VSB Ebola vaccine. And uh, this project started recently on uh, the 1st of March and will last for three years, involving uh, 12 partners from uh, six European countries and U.S. Uh, I am also the managing entity coordinator, so the coordinator of uh, the public institution of the FLUCO project, which is uh, uh, focused on uh, the standardization and development of biomarkers for the assessment of immunoresponse to influenza vaccines in humans, and involves 22 partners uh, from eight countries. And uh, this also started now the 1st of March and will last for five years. And uh, also I uh, am a partner of the BioVaxSafe project, uh, which is uh, uh, focused on the study of the safety of biomarkers of safety of vaccines. And uh, this started uh, in uh, 2012, and this is uh, a five years project, and in this project I participate as a research partner. So I, I can say that I have different perspectives in different projects uh, and a different type of interaction in uh, uh, the different type of partnerships. Thank you. It sounds like you must be marvelously good at managing your time. I, <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. So, and time has already come up uh, in terms of devoting time without, w without reimbursement to, to the project. And so I suppose it's, it's a natural thing to ask, what is it that's so unique about IMI that causes all of you from your different perspectives to be so involved in it? Who wants to take that first? Sandra, do you want to go first? Um, so I'll go back to the point. So the question here is what's unique about IMI and what compelled us to or incited us to uh, participate in, uh, in IMI here. So I'll bring back the point I made in the previous, uh, to the previous question in the introduction is the patient centricity here. Uh, whatever we do at JDRF for the 45 years we've been in existence and uh, Anders explained this morning in the keynote session is uh, it's a very patient-centric organization. So we bring the patient voice here in the patient advisory committee. So that would be our principal component and contribution where we bring here. We also, uh, at JDRF, we have a very, very good body and history of experience in working across the spectrum here. So we, we certainly have been funding and continue to fund primarily academic researchers in both the basic and the clinical space. But we work expansively with the for-profit sector in trying to develop medicines, therapeutics, dev therapies, devices, both drugs and biologics, etc. So we are very experienced in the laws and bylaws and conflicts of interest and other things that it takes to galvanize academicians with industry, with regulators, and eventually with payers. So that's something we thought that from our experience can we, we, we bring to the table. 
Finally, there's also a very good strategy that we take in trying to tackle type 1 diabetes across all stages and ages, right from prevention when you are at risk of developing the disease all the way into when you've developed uh, end-stage complications, for example. So we look at the, at the whole gamut of or the whole spectrum of type 1 diabetes. So I think in addition to bringing some financial and non-financial resources, we we bring these to the table and an IMI perfectly complements that or you can look at it the other way around, they perfectly complement what we bring to the table. And so it was a, it, it was an, it's, it was an obvious marriage. Mm. Thank you. Donato, do you? Thank you. Uh, certainly from our perspective, uh, IMI gives a unique opportunity to work together of different stakeholders public organization, private organization, industry, small and medium uh, and large industries, as well as uh, regulatory bodies, patient association. And this is a unique opportunity. Also because we all work to uh, reach a common aim, which has been set as a priority by the industry. So we know that this will come to its application. And this is a, a very important aspect. So for um, our experience, uh, is not always easy. It needs a lot of effort of working together, speaking the same language, but is uh, an effort which is very rewarding and bringing to unique, out unique outcomes. Thank you. Corinne, did you want to comment on this? Thank you. Um, I think there's so many things unique about IMI. But, uh, to me, the key things that have come to mind is that pharmaceutical companies work together in research projects um, where normally they are each other's competitors and that brings challenges I would imagine um, but ultimately in, in IMI it is because yeah as on, on their own the companies can't achieve what needs to be achieved and so ultimately the this aim this this notion that you've got commercial organizations working together Okay, for, for ultimately profit, but clearly also for ultimately European public health, global public health, uh, even if you think about the Ebola and some of the other projects. I think that is, um, that's amazing. And so you've got, what I also find industry interesting is that industry is setting the research agenda to an extent, but they do invite uh, call topics. We have suggested them so far. Most of them have been taken, so... Yeah, I think uh, great opportunities. So some, one thing that was interesting in, in your answer, Sandra, was that you, you stressed what you brought to the project, not what you could get out of the project, but oh, what you brought. There's, uh, yeah, uh, certainly we, we get a lot out, which I thought I had addressed in the prior <laughs> question here, is uh, the points that, that Corinne very eloquently made here about uh, trying to get in this pre-competitive space or in the non-competitive space, it is very challenging. And our previous speakers mentioned that very well. It is easier said than done. And IMI is exactly bringing that. It's the glue that is bringing in various for-profit companies to work with the academicians. And this, this pre-competitive space is something that, that we can learn from and we can leverage from. We run a lot of consortia of similar nature, but certainly of much smaller sizes here. So there is something that, that unique about IMI that is brought to the table. Another thing I may, uh, I would remiss if I don't mention is JDRF is an international organization. We are headquartered in, in the U.S., but we have affiliate offices uh, in several countries outside the U.S., including in, in three or four countries in Europe. Um, so we, we are an international organization. We fund over 20 countries. We fund the best research uh, or clinical development in the best parts of the world where they're available. So we're not uh, restricted by borders, and we have a very strong presence in, in Europe. And IMI was, was able to offer uh, much more in the European environment here and complement our efforts here. So we were able to leverage the resources that IMI gifted us with, mm -hmm. I, I would put it this way. So uh, there's, there's a lot there for us to win through this partnership also. Mm -hmm. So that's why you and your organizations, organizations are involved. But this morning, Demetrius mentioned that he encounters occasional barriers to academics crossing the bridge, as he put it. Do you find in your individual sectors that 
there are barriers to people getting involved? And if so, what do you think might be needed to be done to make those barriers lower? Who wants to take it? I can take and start <laughs> with some barriers I can identify. Of course, uh, one um, aspect is that in some areas of critical relevance uh, for Europe, um, in some cases, industries have merged. Are bigger, there are bigger industries, but uh, very few in number. And in this case, it's very difficult to find a convergence in common topics of priority for all the industries. So in this case, I mean, I, I'm coming for the vaccine field and I can make the specific case. The industries left in the vaccine field is very limited in number, even if they are very big and important. So it's also important to consider the possibility of a certain uh, flexibility from IMI rules that uh, when a topic is highly relevant, this can be taken up even if is not commonly shared but all, by all the industries in the field. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one, uh, one uh, aspect uh, that uh, I can see as critical point. The other I can think about is the need of true innovation, with innovative research within the uh, programs. Uh, sometimes this is very challenging uh, because uh, multiple uh, companies participate in the programs and uh, of course this is uh, not easy to share the most innovative technologies and innovations but is critical for the future that key technologies, innovative technologies are developed and applied for the next generation medicines in uh, IMI projects. Thank you. Does anybody want, to, do either of you want to pick up on those, either of those points? Yeah. Something that was mentioned earlier by the speakers here uh, in bridging the gap, and I think it was a Florida uh, analogy that was given, um, there is a gap that, that is not going to be unique to anyone in the audience here when you move from an from a model, disease model, such as an animal model or even a cell-based model into humans. And, um, and, and this disease gap is often widened. And IMI is, at least in, in the few initiatives that we have been involved in and hope to be involved in more uh, coming in the future, IMI is offering in this pre-competitive space an opportunity to bridge that gap here through either innovation or testing here, uh, all that has been developed here. And I think there will be more to come with several commercial partners involved where all their results and data sets will hopefully be shared in a de-identified de fashion where uh, we will learn more from our mistakes of why something hasn't worked in facilitating the development of personalized therapies eventually. So IMI is providing that, and, and hopefully even Horizon 2020 in future, will provide that platform here for everybody to come and harmonize in, in trying to solve the problem together. So there will be synergism out of it, not just the additive effect mm -hmm. of, of several people coming at the table here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you think that as that message is more widely known, that then that will bring more people in there's no, there's no insurmountable barrier to anyone entering. Yeah, I would hope that, you know, the, the smaller biotech sector, which usually is trying to bridge this valley of death, if you will, um, will be encouraged more, given an opportunity to come here. As I think uh, Donata was mentioning, larger pharmaceutical companies generally tend to have resources across the spectrum, but in smaller organizations or even in smaller labs, it is not possible to have different areas of expertise, realms of expertise. So offering that, I think, is also part of bridging the gap, that as an individual investigator, I would, what I could be doing alone or with two or three collaborations, I could be doing much more by exposure to 20 other uh, specialty areas. So I think that's, that's the forum I think IMI is providing here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to go out to the audience at this point and see if there are any comments on what's being said so far, in particular perhaps to Donata's point about the, um, the, 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 the problem of areas that perhaps don't have so many companies working in them and how you build a consortium. But does anybody have any comment on that? Or question? If you'd like to, Magda, please do. 
I have a question about uh, the role for SMEs. Um, what do you intend to do specifically for involving more SMEs? Since uh, it was said that SMEs uh, can already participate, but it's actually more um, SMEs uh, dedicated to services or the ones who um, develop their own product pipeline. So we work on big pharma's product development. Um, you talked about true innovation, and we know that true innovation comes from SMEs. So how, how do you address this in IMI2? How do you um, let SMEs have uh, money involved uh, in their own product development? Do you understand? I can try and, and respond to that question, but I would also like the, the Commission to comment on this one. I think that we should use the tools that we have for what they have been created for. And IMI has not been created to specifically address um, um, SME-related projects. However, like in every program, and you saw that IMI is part of the research program's ecosystem, we aim at the best possible involvement of SMEs by setting questions and programs which can actually actually involve them in the best meaningful way. So it is not about creating something specific for SMEs, but about, and you can suggest that to us, as, as was rightly said by colleagues from EMA, when questions are asked to us, we very often actually um, process them and address them in the course. If there are questions that would benefit SMEs' in involvement in IMI, the programs can be structured in a way that would encourage that by just the nature of the question that would be asked. So I would say, Let's really think about how we can best ask questions which would integrate all, uh, all companies. And I would, I would um, give the floor to Julia, but just the, the, the first question about, uh, about the, the limited number of players sometimes and, and the difficulty. I don't disagree with you. It might be a problem sometimes. Um, we, uh, in the past, needed to have uh, at least two FPA players in order to um, have a, a viable project. Today, this requirement is no longer there, but to be frank with you, one FPA player isn't viable either. So we just encourage multi-companies consortia, but this must not necessarily be an FPA company, mm -hmm. if I may just hint at that. There is a possibility to bring many sectors together and create multi-company uh, consortia as well. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of words on SMEs. Uh, as was said, IME is not aimed directly at SMEs, but it's a, a program where SMEs are involved and in a, in a particular meaningful way. SMEs are a particular concern of the Commission. You saw it in the priorities of President Juncker. Uh, Horizon 2020 was designed with, and there I have also to thank the Parliament for that, with the aim of increasing participation of SMEs and newcomers, because it's not only about SMEs, but new SMEs getting funded by the program. I was looking at the numbers, well, last week in the first year of Horizon 2020, the objective was 20% of participation of SMEs. We are bordering nearly 24%, so uh, with the, the provisional data, so that's a very good um, uh, number. It is perhaps a number that is not felt by SMEs because in a way we are victims of our success. We marketed a lot Horizon 2020 towards SMEs. SMEs have responded in, in an astonishing way, so it's great, a lot of interest from SMEs, also caused by uh, the not so good economic situation, but also because SMEs saw an opportunity. There is incredible oversubscription in the SME instrument, and my commission is really looking at that closely because now the success rate is so small, in a way it becomes nearly a, a lottery. Uh, so a lot of, uh, of projects are evaluated as uh, very good, but don't make the threshold, the financial threshold. It's not because the project is not good. So one of the things my commission is looking at together with Commissioner Careto, who is responsible for, for the, the regional funds, is how to increase synergies with structural funds. Uh, structural funds have flagged 100 billion euros for uh, innovation, and what uh, the services and also the Commission are looking is how to have complementary funding from the funds. This is really at early stages, but we, we hope this will be possible so that this incredible number of very good projects from SMEs can uh, get the attention they deserve. 
Thank you. Irene, you have something to say. Just quickly to add to, to my colleagues here that uh, IMI is really designed to address specific challenges and thereby bringing together all the stakeholders that need to collaborate to address that challenge. So it was, as, as uh, the previous speakers already have said, it's not really an SME instrument. But we have seen in IMI that we have been very attractive to SMEs and in our portfolio of projects, I believe we have some 170 SMEs participating and from IMI about 16% um, of all the funding from IMI actually went to SMEs. So I think we have a very good track record for bringing in, um, as you mentioned, service SMEs, but they, these are often very research intensive SMEs that brings in new innovative ideas and thoughts into the projects. Thank you. Okay, if we just bring things back to the panel. Yes, I know. Do, do people have questions for the panel? Not on? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, Jean Long, uh, Sanofi. I had a question for Dr. De Vries. You mentioned the terms from EMR conflict of interest. And I, I thought, perhaps naively, that IMI was really a partnership of interest. So could you describe or clarify to us what for regulators this conflict of interest will be within the scope of IMI? We can be perceived to have tons of conflicts of interest. Um, you know, where do I start and where do I stop? We get approached, for instance, by a number of consortia. If we haven't been involved in the call, in the drawing up of the call, we get um, faced with that as a, as a late stage, if you will. And then th we have the question of, okay, which consortium are we going to participate in? If we're going to participate in any, and if we choose one over another, then and then that that's you, it could be argued that that consortium has a has an advantage because EMI is involved and then we win and so we have a conflict of interest. Can't do that. So we're working on finding other ways of addressing that. That's one. Then if um, at a late stage where, in, well, no, there, there's another example where there's a call. We uh, work on developing the call, but actually it was very late. Well, it, you know, we get, we get accused of we haven't considered involving every uh, possible stakeholder that we should have invited to the consortium. And we, you know, we try our best and we try and approach everybody, but that's where we are perceived to have a conflict of interest, that we've only approached a few and not everybody on the, in the whole world. If there is a, um, a method that's being developed, and it, I think a lot of it is also to do with misunderstanding. So people don't understand how our procedures work. But for instance, if a biomarker is being developed, then um, what we would argue as an agency is if you want that, you know, it's in everybody's interest to make sure that whatever biomarker or outcome, health outcome, patient reported outcome, et cetera, that is being developed is ultimately going to help getting the products on the market. And if our committees ultimately believe that the, 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 the weight of the evidence isn't good enough and, oh, if only in your research program you had considered A, B, and C as well, then you would have had it. Um, you know, that doesn't benefit anybody. So then we say, why don't you come for scientific advice? Or why don't you send this to a qualification advice? That bears a fee, unless you're well, a very much lower fee if you're an SME. And because we offer that advice, we have a conflict of interest because we're charging money for the, the consequences of you following our advice. I think that's just a list of first examples that immediately come to mind. But I'll stop there. Donati, you, you just mentioned that you, EMA is involved in your project. How, how are they involved? No, no, I, I would like really to support what you are saying in the sense that in all the cases we have been inviting EMA to participate. They have been very helpful but as observers, not as partners, just for the conflict of interest you are indicating. But it's very important and it's very helpful to have as advisors in the external advisory board or as a, so that they can uh, dra um, help all the process of the project and uh, giving constant advice. So it's very helpful and important to have your role in uh, the advisory board. And this is what we, we are having. And just talking about SMEs uh, going back, I think uh, that in all our projects there is a very good example of very active collaboration of SMEs with large industries, with public uh, uh, research uh, groups. And this is uh, 
um, based on what is reported from SMEs, a very important added value to have the opportunity to work together in collaborative projects with large industries and with public organizations. Mm -hmm. And of course offers a different type of instruments and opportunity compared to the SME instrument, but in this case the, the added value is collaborative research with large industries and with other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. Can I just say one more thing? Just so one of the way in of the ways in which we try to address the conflict of interest challenges that we face is that we are now um, moving to a situation where we say, okay, before the draft calls come out, we will already decide what level of participation we can offer to the consortium, then we offer that kind of contribution to whichever is the winning consortium if they want us. And I think that in that's one way in which we try to address it. Okay. Thank you. So um, I wanted to turn a little bit to the, to the development, the continuing development of, of IMI2. Um, Sandra, you've, your organization has already come a very long way together with IMI. Um, but if one, if one is to continue what Richard Bergstrom this morning described as the wave of inclusion, how do you see the project developing? So for the future of IMI, so I am, IMI, this is also a learning experience for us, I think, as much as for IMI. And I want to also congratulate, this is the first year anniversary of how we came fully active as a partner, associate partner, uh, in May of 2014 was the patient, uh, I don't remember what it was exactly called, I think it was called the patient um, uh, focus meeting. And so this is about the one year anniversary of that. So this, this is, we have come certainly a long way. Moving into the future, while there are, there's certainly a lot that can be done in specific areas such as big data management or uh, cell-based therapies for replacing in the case of diabetes or even diabetic complications, one of the areas, and I saw a little bit of that in Magda's slide at the end, to the best of our involvement, we haven't seen a whole lot of the payer space involved in IMI. We see researchers, drug and device developers, uh, regulatory agencies, but there seems to be a void, at least in the ones JDRF is involved in, in getting a perspective of w what it is that will uh, excite the payers in terms of the overall health care here. Perhaps you're doing that in some of the other areas, but not so much in diabetes, for example. Uh, that is an area that JDRF is very actively involved in, both in the U.S. as well as outside of the U.S., uh, in Europe, for example. Uh, so that, I think, would be an effective uh, additional um, partner to be included here. Um, not exactly sure in what shape or form, but, but I'm sure uh, they could be incl included at some stage here. So that's one thing I think could be an evolving um, role for IMI and, and for all the participants to benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, there's several others, but let me see what the others have to Thank say. Thank you, so. yes, okay. Corinne, you're writing, do you want to? Thank you. Um, okay, so the future for IMI, I think, you know, sky is the limit, I would hope. Uh, I think of that as a, lot, as a number of levels. So I think initially, sh just on the very sh relatively short term, um, within the agency, one of the, as the um, projects we've been working on is, was recently, recently been published as our white spots paper, where we say, okay, what, from what comes in the business pipeline, what, from what comes to our committees, from what we, the information we see in the SME office, in the Innovation Task Force, etc., which are the disease areas where we know there are products coming through the pipeline, and which are the disease areas where we know, well, as far as we are aware, there isn't anything coming in the next 10 years. So that's relatively short term. What I also hope is short term, I hope it is short term, is um, drug safety in pregnancy. And I know that there is, uh, there is a focus on special populations. I think pregnancy is very special because companies can get away with putting don't use in pregnancy. And it's not always the solution. Whereas other special populations, pediatric, older people, etc., if you know the product's going to be used, then you have to study it. And I think 60 years after thalidomide being the cause of our current regulatory system, if I can put it very black and white, I think, you know, something really, can we have some more innovative thinking in that area in the short term? Longer term, I'm thinking 
for IMI, are we thinking big enough? Are we um, really, in current IMI, having a look towards the future in the longer distance? Are we looking at, are we thinking 2050 when we, when we think about innovation? Are we aware of what is happening in other areas of medicines development sufficiently so that it feeds into IMI to as much as it perhaps could be? Have we got enough innovative thinking external to medicines development that could actually help medicines innovation that we are just blind to because of IMI still being, uh, you know, even though all the key players are involved, it's still medicines development, still pharma companies, pharma regulators, pharma scientists in a way. Um, yeah, so it, is there sufficient involvement of innovative thinking? Thank you very much indeed. Oh, yeah, please, no, please answer. I just want to pick up on this excellent point that, that Corinne just made here, which I, I had kind of written up here too, is two more flavors of uh, IMI, if it's possible to incorporate in the future, I think will only add to the value of IMI. One is a forum for international participation, uh, whether it is through, where, where there is an ex exclusive expertise internationally uh, not present within the Europe and can be justified within the intellect of a given project, if there, there's an avenue for accommodating that only where applicable, I think that would be a, a huge strength of IMI. We constantly, this is a global initiative. I don't necessarily consider it an European initiative, but do thank Europe for starting it here. And the other point that, that Corinne made here is about bringing in other faculties and thinking thinking out here. While it's excellent that for the big data you're bringing in um, algorithm developers, mathematicians, uh, at JDRF on several programmatic levels such as the artificial pancreas or encapsulation of islet cells, we have found it very critical to bring in biomedical engineers, uh, imaging companies, imaging of human tissue during the pathogenesis of a disease. Uh, these do not come conventionally from within a pharmaceutical company. They do not reside within that. So thinking in the out years, maybe communicating it and encouraging other uh, non-medical, conventional non-medical partners to be part of this, I think will be, a, will be of critical advantage to the development of effective therapies. Okay, just let, let me have Donato comment and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to link to the comments made uh, which are very relevant. For example, the aspect of uh, the target population and the design of personalized medicine for the different target population. Uh, pregnancy women, pregnant women is one, but of course in an aging population we have to consider also the elderly and the uh, different age groups. Uh, so it's very important, for example, in the design of vaccines uh, that are mostly designed for children that we consider the different uh, age groups and we optimize uh, the uh, vaccine for the specific age groups and this is relevant also for uh, the other medical intervention. So this is uh, a critical aspect that needs a lot of knowledge, for example, on the immunosystem of the aging population, of the children, of the differences during the lifespan. So needs the joining, the knowledge and the efforts of the public research organization, of the industries, to tackle specific um, issue. Uh, the other aspect is uh, that, uh, um, that was raised the importance of cross-fertilization of different sectors, different uh, um, areas, uh, such as the importance of uh, applying modeling and uh, mathematical modeling and prediction to the, these studies to ensure that we obtain the maximum outcome from the studies, research studies we are doing, both in preclinical and in clinical studies. And we uh, obtain the maximum out of uh, the, the studies we are conducting also through systems myology approaches, uh, modeling uh, approaches, uh, and that can then help us to design next generation interventions. Thank you. And of course, to address the importance of novel technologies for next generation medicines. Thank you very much indeed. Well, there's a whole raft of ideas there from payers to pregnancy to expanding the universe. 
of uh, involved people, which is wonderful. So, um, comments and questions on that. You had one there, did you? So the, the man with the glasses who has had his hand up for a long time. great health benefits. So uh, within the European Society of Cardiology, we're very much structuring ourselves towards innovation and implementation because we see one of the big problems from the clinical perspective about innovation is you get great scientists, you get great technology, but then it doesn't actually, when it hits the clinical coalface, it goes nowhere. Uh, and we see that as a catch-22 situation because when you get low market penetration, then you get high unit costs. Uh, high unit costs then kill uh, the, uh, the implementation. So innovation and implementation must go hand in hand. And it is about how do we make uh, clinical research much less expensive because I think that Europe to some extent is pricing itself out of the clinical research market. Uh, so how do we get uh, more cost-effective clinical trials? How do we get better implementation? And how do we get a little bit more focus on the very busy, highly pressured clinical co-face uh, and a little bit of relief and injection of research money at that point? Thank you. Please. Sorry, microphone here. So. What, first here and then here. I just wanted to point out to, the, to follow up on the ideas of uh, getting uh, to, to expand the universe. I think first of all we have to, to adjust our, our um, basis of communication because when you make it infinite complex the system, you need a different form of communication and a new form of management. So I think the business schools will have to get involved there to really develop new forms of management of such big consortia. Another aspect is we have to find exactly the balancing line between being effective and ineffective if we increase complexity. As good as, and as important it is to have many players in the game, it is really important not to, to go through a, a, a new barrier that we are building up because it gets infinitely complex. It's a very interesting point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Please, I'm sorry, you had your hand up. So, Next here, please. And then, is there another microphone for this lady here? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, this time, um, European Platform Patient Organization Size and Industry. Um, the points that you are making is right now we are working on, let's say, working on the management. Of, because we are a multi-stakeholder, we are getting more stakeholders. So it's very complex to have different mumbo-jumbo of the different ecosystems to talk with each other uh, or actually get the communication or the message forward. So right now we're working with the TU Delft right now on gaming so that the gaming modeling of communication, get that forward, is actually helping us as an organization quite a lot to have communication messages go much, for, much faster to different stakeholders because imaging us much faster as talking or having the mumbo jumbo in place. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we do have, next to the gaming people, we are also working a lot with um, in and exclusion master data so that the information that comes in, we need big data, we need a lot of data, but please quality data. So if we are talking about quality data, we should not start, uh, because I'm now here at the pharma, but next week I'm again with the IT guys that say more data, more data. But you see that they just miss, let's say, the master data thinking of the healthcare environment. I see that here the master thinking of the pharma and the physicians is missing because we have uh, my master of public health from Maastricht is telling me public health and the uh, need for public health is much bigger than the primary, secondary and tertiary care can actually give. So we need to go for an other solution as the systems that are right now in place. And what I really miss here, that's the last and then I give it forward. Uh, the, the thing that I really miss is that we are actually grabbing still, let's say, the old players and we just forget that we have to have a paradigm change in the system 
to actually get a triage up front of the primary, secondary, tertiary care. And getting data from there is actually not right now, whereas where we are speaking the whole time here of the institutes, of the, uh, the, the whole pharma industry. We actually need data from outside of the healthcare system, so more of the Internet of Things, as MIT is right now working. A lot of Internet of Things data of personal people can then actually skip over to the uh, electronic health record and at once give information that is giving the possibility of triage so that the cardiologist here is actually only getting the people at his door that actually need this help. Please can the panel give a little bit of feedback on my frustration I, I, here. All, all great points and I think Irene uh, earlier addressed your first point but I really like your last point of reverse engineering where we can probably learn more from what's out there. I would include healthcare systems here. So not have a preconceived hypothesis on what we're going to try and work on, but just to see what is out there with years, decades of experience there, and then identify what is the unmet need there on a larger population basis. Is it population screening? Is it outcomes research? Is it comparative effectiveness therapies? I'm not so sure, or it may be a combination of the above, and, and kind of reverse engineer into what our question or hypothesis should be, and then integrate the, the, the players absolutely needed, I think the point Irene was making, and also have many players, but not in a chaotic situation, have it in a very concerted fashion. So it's a very interesting point to bring up. Thank you, Sanjay. Yes, we've been, we've been waiting. Please. Thank you. Hello, Dimitria Buzikova. My question is more oriented to the policy makers, probably. I'm coming from the medical device industry, and as you know, medical devices are connected to the health, and they have to be submitted to clinical trials. And they, we have a gap after the research. For the research first, we have to fight a, a lot with uh, competitors from other sectors because there are very few programs, if maybe none, which are oriented to medical devices. There is a lot about pharma then engineering, but we are somewhere in between. And then we have to fight with the other sectors, which is much more complicated. And then once we go to the clinical trials, there is a gap for funding. There is no more fun public funding, and private is very complicated to get it. So I was just wondering if something is envisaged to be planned in that yeah, area. I might, I might save that for just one second, because did you have a comment on, on, for the panel? Yeah. Could you just pass the microphone down? We'll just deal with that, and then we'll come to you. Because this yes. will be the last question for the yeah. panel. Um, I, I think we are missing one very basic message, or at least not stressing it enough. Every patient is different, every tumor is different, every tumor cell can be different and can react differently to the drug. Uh, <laughs> if we compare where we are in our cutting edge stratified medicine, it's roughly where weather forecast was at the time of Charles Darwin when they first published on the uh, statistical correlation between the um, uh, development of the barometric pressure and the development of the weather. See, there's a very good reason why we don't predict the weather, which is again a completely unique phenomenon. No weather has, no weather forecast has ever been there before. Therefore, you can't use statistics, you can't lose, uh, use knowledge base. I think the only approach which, in my view, will work is to do the, the same thing we do everywhere else, which is to model every single individual patient and the models have to sooner or later become good enough that we can actually treat the individual patient based on the outcome of treating the virtual patient with all possible treatment options and then selecting whatever. And that obviously uh, clinical trials will basically have to be focused on the individual and not on the old black bus, uh, buster model. So I think, I think this is not really considered enough in those plans. Also the big data is really a statistical approach. It's not really directed I, at uh, Thank you very much. I, I, think, I, th I, think, I think that what, what your question or your comment underlines is the need for mathematicians to be involved in all of this as well. But anyway, we, I'm afraid we are now very short of time. 
and um, so I, I really have only time to thank my panel unless they want to make a 10 second last comment but they probably, that's probably too much no? no, none of you, good ok, well then let me thank you all for raising many many different topics in a very short space of time thank you all <laughs>